Hello, John. Welcome to the Hidden Why podcast. Great to have you here today. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure. This sounds like it's going to be a very interesting conversation. You're a uh, neuroscientist, neuropsychologist, John? Is that neuro right? Neuropsychiatrist and uh, neuroscientist. So a I... Neuropsychologist and neuroscientist. What is that all about? Obviously, the neurology of... The well, I'm a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, not a uh -huh. uh, psychologist. So I've directed programs for many years of people who have combined medical, neurological, and psychiatric illness. Mm -hmm. And so I've spent many years looking at how the mind affects medical, how the mind affects the body, and how the body affects the mind. And uh, as a result, and I've spent a lot of time with brain injury. Uh, I have many brain injury programs and I've been innovative in these combined programs. But in the last 10 years, I've gotten also involved in my neuroscience interest. And I have a website where I was exploring what is mind and uh, particularly where is it in nature? Is it in brains? Uh, that's what most people think, most scientists think, but actually that's, it's more complicated than that because the more I looked at things, the more very small brains, insects have incredible intelligence. Bees do symbolic logic, understand how to solve mathematical problems. Uh, they have abstract concepts. They medicate themselves. Ants, termites, very intelligent. But then cells, it turns out, are very intelligent. And they are actually talking to each other. And that struck me as a very important thing that isn't it's, it's not obvious to most people or even most scientists. And the reason why not is because most science is obscured by terrible jargon. So people have all these names of receptors and genes and no one can read it. It's like a completely gobbledygook. Mm. It's a foreign That'd language. Be great. Myself, people say, what languages do you speak? I say, well, I speak uh, uh, molecular biology, molecular genetics, these foreign languages. And I was translating these into English for about 10 years. And then I realized that nowhere is there the simple explanation of how it all works. And it works through cells talking to each other, sending right. signals of all kinds. Uh, we all sort of know that neurons talk to each other. Everyone knows sort of neurons have an axon and send a signal and there are circuits. You know, we learned that in, oh, in school. Well, we, we do. Some, some people do, but maybe explain that to us too, because that's important, maybe starting point. What are yes. neurons and how do they communicate? Yeah, so one of the first things people are taught and what scientists believe is that neurons um, are cells that send these long... Uh, axons to other cells and they signal and each one is connected with 10,000 100,000 other cells and there are 86 billion of them so there's trillions of connections it's like this massive living uh, thing that's constantly changing connections and, uh, and yet it's much more complicated than that because there are all other brain cells the astrocytes of uh, the microglia these are the, like the immune cells in the brain and the supportive cells and the cells that make uh, the fatty tissue that that speeds up the signal. It's incredibly complicated. Uh, but most people know that neurons send these signals if they studied any uh, biology. Yeah, or brain. so electronic signals between neurons? Yeah, electronic along the uh, wire, and then at the end, it's a chemical. Um, so th those are neurotransmitters, and people's heard of them, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, all that kind of stuff you read about, are the mm. chemical that goes across the gap to the next one, and then an electrical thing, and then a, a chemical, and it's all electrical and chemical. Um, but what, what is not widely known is that all the same communication occurs with all the cells. So for example, capillary cells, blood vessel cells are telling stem cells what to do and how to make different cells in a similar way with like some sort of electrical signal and chemical and that or well, a bit different? usually, usually uh, it's very hard to study this stuff because uh, it's like tiny. It. we're talking about molecules so what yeah. we know is mostly the chemical signals there are undoubtedly electrical signals and there's a lot of activity in how electricity can stimulate various parts of the brain, uh, which I study also. But, but the fact of the matter is I stuck with what we know. So my book is totally proven 
exact science. And even that is quite amazing. And it shows how intelligent these cells are. So you have mostly chemical signals. You have immune cells talking to brain cells. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. So when we get sick, the T cell, which is the most famous immune cell, sort of the master regulator cell, tells the neuron to make the sick feeling. And it creates this feeling where we have to lie down, we feel feverish, we feel fatigued. The sick feeling is from a communication of an immune cell floating around outside of the brain with a signal to the neuron to make the sick feeling so we will take care of ourselves. When we're healthy again, only the T cell can send this signal to the neuron to tell it to stop the six feeling. And then it sends a pulse saying, well, stay with normal cognition now, no fog, no, 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 just stay normal cognition. And when it needs it, it'll send the signal to create the brain fog again. Uh, that's one. Another one is that memory, part of the memory process, memory is very complicated and we could talk about how to use what we know about memory to deal with trauma, traumatic experiences. But one thing we know is that it, we make new brain cells only in one particular area in the memory. We only make new brain cells as adults in the nose and in the memory center. And these are incorporated into new memories. So it's the T cell again that tells the neuron, keep making, I mean, the stem cell in the brain, it's not even the neuron, it's a precursor of a neuron to make new neurons so we can have normal memory. When depression occurs, we, it gets a signal to slow it down and we get the brain fog of depression. When we have acute stress, we get more memory for a while. And then if it goes on, chronic stress, it's like depression, we get a brain fog. And again, the T cell tells the neuron when to restart going back to normal cognition. So this, these are signals. Now, just like the, the mm. T cell sending a signal to the neuron, the neuron we've discovered through the science of communication of cells, the neuron is telling the immune cells what to do. And no one ever knew this. So for example, um, everyone knew in meditation, for example, that the vagus nerve, the huge vagus nerve that affects the heart, the lungs, all the, the gut, it, when we meditate, it relaxes the vagus. So it relaxes the breathing and relaxes the heart and the gut. So you're, you're calmer, but no one could ever figure out how meditation would help immunity. And what we discovered is that the same nerve also sends signals in the spleen, the vagus nerve. The to, vagus nerve, yeah. Uh, to immune cells. And it's so when you meditate, you end up with our 200 factors that are better uh, immunity and it gets better and better as time goes on. Your so what, what is the vagus nerve like by, by meditating? How does that um, uh, influence in a positive way the vagus nerve? Well, something about calming the vagus nerve creates this relaxation where the heart rests, the gut rests, the breathing is slower, and we can influence it starting with the breathing and with meditation. In that calm state, the vagus is stimulating the immune system as well. And we never knew that. Here's another example. So, so there are these circuits of immune cells, brain cells, blood cells, even cancer cells are part of this. Even microbes are part of this communication. People ask, well, why do we read about microbes being so important? Like everywhere you read, there's microbes now, gut mm. microbes. But why? Why are microbes so important? Well, the reason is that they speak the same language as our cells, and they, therefore they can influence. So they're sending signals in their community but they're also sending signals to other communities and they're sending signals back and forth to our gut lining cells, our skin cells, our immune cells, our cancer cells. They're helping and fighting with this communication. So we have a lot of helpful uh, microbes sending positive signals. So let, let me give you one more example of this new science of, of, of uh, one little branch of it are neuroendocrine circuits, but there's also cancer microbe circuits, blood vessel, there's all kinds of circuits. All the cells mm. are talking to each other. So this is one. So we never knew how acupuncture works. No one could figure it out because you would think from a scientific point of view, it would have to work along some energy flow, but it's not along. So in the West, we would think of 
energy flow being blood, blood flowing, or neurons or electrical flow, but it's neither. So some people think, well, there are electrical flows through the, the fascia, through the tissue. But one thing that was discovered in this uh, research about cell communication is they found an acupuncture spot in, in, in the wrist and they stimulated it with electricity in, in an acupuncture needle and it affected the spleen. So it affects something all the way over in the other part of the body. Well, how did that work? Well, they looked very carefully and what they noticed is that beneath the needle, there was a T cell, an immune cell, master immune cell sitting there that was stimulated. It then moved a long way, sent signals to the neurons and, and got involved in the, in the neural circuit. So again, that's a neuroimmune circuit. It goes both ways. So there's going to the neurons and from the neurons back. Anyway, there's a million examples of how important this is for health, um, like cancer cells. Yeah. We all have the impression, I mean, we, we all know now that microbes are these smart little cells that work in communities and the communities form other communities and they talk to our gut cells and the, uh, even viruses, by the way, I, can, I talk about viruses in the book, uh, viruses signal also, they're part of the conversation, um, but cancer, no one ever thinks that cancer cells are extremely intelligent cells. These are cells that have gotten broken the bounds of normalcy so they can reproduce. They're like a T cell, but they're a T cell that has taken on, what a T cell breaks the bounds when it needs to form a million warriors to fight a virus. So suddenly yeah. it just goes crazy and metabolism, it changes all the rules and it makes th you know, thousands of cells. And then it has signals where it dies back. Cancer has learned how to do that that same kind of thing to take over, build a community, but they're sending just the way microbes send genes to each other to fight against antibiotics, cancer cells send genes to each other to fight against viruses, bacteria, but also to fight against our medications. So uh, they actually communicate, they, they communicate with blood vessels to create special blood vessels. They communicate with connective tissue to help build the structure of this new uh, cancer structure. They communicate with all, of, they sort of take over and manipulate all the cells through this communication. So right. cancer, anyway, so understanding the new science of how cells signal really tells you a lot about the future of medicine and what we're going to be doing and, and what's going to be coming down the pike. Yeah, and again, it must be a field that's very hard to study being that it's, it's so tiny um to, to figure that out talk to us about just you know cancer cells for example now these are something that are in all of us these cancer cells i'm sorry i didn't know these cancer cells are in all of us well cancer cells are cells cancer starts in a lot of different ways but basically it involves uh mutations in genes so we have our normal genes like every cell has all the genes. But you notice there's a huge difference between a blood cell and a neuron. A neuron is this long thing with a very great structure and, and there's a kidney cell and there's a heart muscle cell. They're all of the same DNA, but only, but a lot of it is silenced in structures inside the nucleus, it's just sort of quieted. And only this area, this area, this area are gonna operate in this particular cell. Stem cells have all of it operating, but then when it becomes a particular cell, only some of them operate. Wow. So what cancer cells do is they break this down. Some by accident, some because of viruses, the viruses help them break it down. Uh, inflammation and um, obesity create, and other metabolic disturbances create sort of havoc in the cells, okay? Inflammation is when you're fighting an infection and there's all kinds of things happening. White cells are there fighting and platelets are there fighting and the, the, the blood vessels are fighting. There's all kinds of stuff going on. During inflammation, a cell can, can like a T cell, can break the bounds of normalcy and, and use some mutations to affect the, the, the very pathway that gives them more powers. So they break down, they change the gene structure and they become more powerful. And then they, they become so powerful that they're not gonna die, that they're just gonna reproduce. 
and stay alive. And they change their mitochondria. And not only that, do they change the mitochondria, but they send altered mitochondria to their friends. And they send them either in little sacs or in nanotubes, tubes that go between the cells. Cancers love nanotubes and they love, they're called exosomes. They're, they're little sacs filled with information. They'll fill it with a, a mitochondria that's altered to help this cell become abnormally strong. Mm. So once they've done that, then what they have to do is communicate to the local cells to help them. So they then get their neighbors to build a, a structure, a new structure, a new organ. They get blood vessel cells to build special blood vessel cells that won't allow immune cells to come through and attack them. Hmm. They even trick immune cells and they become friends and they're embedded in the cancer, these immune cells, and they trick microbes. Microbes can become part of the cancer cell and they're all sort of there communicating and this colony is growing. And that's, now it also can take these little sacs and send them. So each tissue has its own dialect. They speak basically the same language, but it's a difference between Irish and American or Australian and American. There's a slightly yeah. different dialect. Yeah. So the liver will have a dialect, the lung will have a dialect and the cancers tend to know certain dialects better than others. So let's say they know the brain and the, and the breast or the liver. They will then send their little sacs out in the blood and it'll land in the brain and the brain, it, it understands the brain. So it'll then, it's sending uh, like DNA or RNA or some proteins. It'll send enough stuff where it could start a new colony by convincing the local cells that they're friends. And then the local cells create a new colony and that becomes a metastatic site of the cancer. Now, meanwhile, just the way microbes are sending messages between each other and fighting off enemies, the cancer cells are doing that. They're sending messages to fight off enemies, which are immune cells that we send, our antibiotics that we send, and some microbes fight against cancer. Some help the mm. cancers, some fight against cancer. So this is a community of intelligent cells is what it is. Yeah. Like all the, like all the cells. Yeah. The cancer cells are fairly intelligent. And the way we fight it now, um, I guess the, way the science of what you're talking about might help us fight cancer in a, in a very different way using cells. Yes, well... Do we do that already or no? Well, several, you know, basically, you know, Ray Kurzweil, the futurists, and Andy Weil, the integrative medicine, both of them said that this paradigm, understanding how it works, will now allow us to look for treatments. At least it's more complicated than we thought because all the cells are talking, but at least we know where to look and we're looking for these signals now. And that's the future of medicine. So the book goes into an understanding that anyone can read. It's not technical at all. It's just, it's really very naturalistic. I just described the yeah. lifestyle of the cells, but it mm. shows where the science needs to go. So you're talking about stopping or, or instigating the communication channels between cells. Well, an example is, so there's natural communications that go on between a virus, mm -hmm. let's say, and a, a particular kind of cell. Some are helpful. Viruses are mostly helpful, by the way. Well, let's They're talk only... about the recent virus that's well, caused pandemic in the thing, world. We'll talk about the virus. So viruses and cancers have a natural communication, some of them. So we take that virus and we alter it a little bit and we put a medicine in there and that virus naturally goes right to that cancer and then it injects the medicine. So we use the natural communication we do the same with immune cells. We create a T cell, we put some medicine in there, we send it, it's gonna naturally attack the cancer and the medicine will get in there. So let me talk about viruses. So viruses, so life has been defined inaccurately as a cell that reproduces and uh, has metabolism. But you really can't define life because if you say that you need to be reproduced, I can't reproduce anymore. Am I dead? You know what I mean? So every definition you look at of life doesn't, doesn't fit every example. So a lot, of pe a lot of scientists don't think viruses are alive because they're just a piece of DNA or just a piece of RNA with some protein covering it so it can travel. But what they don't realize is that that's the spore. 
That's not the action. That is a spore. It's hibernating just the way, you know, plants have spores and animals hibernate. This is hibernating. And then it lands in a cell, comes into the cell and basically takes over the cell, creates a factory, places its enzyme in rooms of, of membranes and then operates the cell. And so it clearly is alive. Now, what we don't realize, what most people don't realize is that viruses are everywhere. There are, let's say we have 10 trillion cells, there's 100 trillion uh, bacteria, but then there's 100 billion, uh, I mean, a, a, a billion trillion viruses. There's 100 mm -hmm. viruses for every cell, everywhere. Viruses are the dominant life form on Earth. And they have all the information. They have strands of DNA and RNA of every type. They're like the encyclopedia. And they're tr transferring it around. So evolution occurs. It, it does not occur. So, it, you know, while Darwin was a great man and he was right that there's competition, the Darwin followers got to get it wrong. They don't realize that most of life is not competition, but collaboration communication and cooperation. The cells communicate, they collaborate. All creatures collaborate and communicate. So that's most, that's 95% of life. 5% is competition. We, we've, we've taken that competition and made our societies crazy by it and the world crazy when we don't realize nature is mostly, vastly more cooperation than competition. And um, so the, the viruses, are sending this information back and forth. And most of evolution occurs because of that, because of the sending the strands. So now we now know, like we have a bacteria that becomes resistant to our antibiotics. They, they mm. develop a device that actually takes the antibiotic and shoots it out <laughs> of the cell. They create these things that look like uh, syringes or spaceships, launchers. And uh, they build these launchers with a gene which tells you how to manufacture it, the virus takes that, 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 that instruction sheet and it sends it to all of its friends. And it sends it, it not only sends that one, it sends the instruction sheets for other bacteria, other antibiotics, which haven't, they haven't, we haven't even sent yet. In other words, it sends it all kinds of information. So the viruses have all the information and they're transferring stuff all over the place. Most, so we're living, oh, viruses are absolutely essential for us. Mm. Let me give you a couple of examples. Do you have time for a couple of examples? Yeah, so, yeah, please. Okay, so our cell has DNA, right? When they looked at how much of our DNA are what we call genes, meaning they make the proteins, it was only 2%, 2%. 98% are not making these proteins. Well, then we found out that maybe another 40% are making RNAs that are regulatory that help manipulate the DNA in those 2%. But what about the other 60%? Well, turns out 50% are what's called jumping genes. These are old viruses that are in the brain that have the ability to cut themselves out and put the, they're, they're like retroviruses. So like HIV, HIV enters, it cuts, it makes an opening in the DNA, it, it sews itself in, closes it up, it has the, the enzymes to do that. And these jumping genes can take them out, move them over here, sew them in, make copies of it, move them around. These, and then we've, the cell has developed ways to control this. But, and then there's another 10% where it's just retroviruses like HIV, where they put their DNA right in there. So there's jumping genes, which are basically virus-like, and there's the old-fashioned uh, HIV retrovirus type have a 10%. Now that 10% area is five times more than all of our genes put together, okay? You're not talking about a small area. When what was discovered is that many very, very important molecules come from viruses. So for example, the molecule that creates placentas comes from a virus. It's syncytium. It's, it's like the spike. We all know about the spike now in Corona. It's a thing that connects. Syncytium is a connector. And we took that virus gene and used the connection to create a connection with the placenta. 
And all placentas are based upon a virus gene. Just a couple of weeks ago, it was discovered that myelin, which is very, very important, it's what pads the axons so it can communicate better, that's from a virus. Mm. When, when this guy, when one of the geniuses of the, uh, who won the Nobel Prize was figuring out how to make stem cells from like taking a muscle cell and moving it back to a stem cell and then making a neuron from that or taking a skin cell and making a neuron, what they found is that you need certain molecules that are called factors that affect the DNA. They're called transcription factors. So these factors come from viruses. So he won the Nobel Prize for finding that these four factors are from nice. viruses. And mm. that was what was necessary to make stem cells. It's all over the place. The other thing that's important is that the diff the human brain is quite remarkable. And it, 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 it enlarged extremely rapidly in evolution, basically from about 30 million years ago, it enlarged tremendously. And so the human brain is different from all the other brains. And the, the two differences from a genetic point of view are, our cells learned how to splice and sew and reconnect so that you could take one gene and instead of making one protein, you could cut it up, sew it together in 500 different ways and make 500 proteins. Right. It's called alternative splicing. Right. The fact that we have alternative splicing, the, the place in the universe that has the most alternative splicing is the human brain. Not only that, but the cortex, the largest the expansion. This alternative splicing was absolutely vital to the human brain. Turns out that comes from a fight between jumping to a virus. <laughs> so virus, we learned. Is that why the brain evolved so quickly 30 million years ago? Because of a virus? It, it developed very rapidly in evolution from, a, from an ape to a human. To a human. Uh, For that rapidly. reason of, of viruses. And because of viruses. So what happened is our cells were fighting with the viruses, trying to control it, and they learned how to splice and edit. And by learning how to splice and edit, they then adapted that to splice and edit in developing the brain. Gosh. So viruses are absolutely... So in the gut, there are viruses that hang around. So there's our lining cells. We make friends with certain bacteria that create vitamins, that are involved in uh, breaking down fiber in a good way. And then there are enemy ones and we fight against those. Well, there's a team of viruses with the bacteria near the mucus layer. There's the cell in the mucus layer. There are special viruses live in that mucus layer that help us and attack enemy cells. So viruses are our are, are friends. They're absolutely essential. What's happening with coronavirus is that we live in ecology. We live in systems of animals, plants, humans, and humans are constantly tearing down these ecologies and the viruses that have lived in peace with other animals for 50 million years suddenly meet a human and say, wow, what's this? This is a human. They jump onto the human. And they say, well, this is an interesting story. Not only can I manipulate this human, but there are billions of them and I can really uh, go crazy. Uh, so what happens is that we expose ourselves in ways that we should not be doing. And then we end up with viruses that really have other niche, but we've sort of intruded upon the niche and then mm. they jump on humans. That's, that's what happened with Corona. And it's happening with others because we're destroying habitats. Right, that's interesting. You, you talk a lot about the mind um, in, in your work, and I guess it's involvement with the cells, uh, the crossover there. What if, what, where is the mind? What is the mind? Because you're well, sort of saying very, it's not, not in the brain. That's a very good question. The truth of the matter is, we have no idea scientifically what the mind is, where it is, uh, we have no idea what intelligence is or consciousness is. Is, 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 the, the, is, the, is the consciousness and the mind sort of correlated or the same thing? Or is the consciousness... Yeah. Whatever you think they should be. So in other words, we don't have any definitions. There's no scientific definition. Scientists, who, because we don't know what mind is and because our science is not set up 
to look at what mind is, say, well, mind doesn't exist. It's just an epiphenomenon. It's just the brain creating some like like the matrix. It's it's not real. It's just a computer simulation. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, the one thing we all know, every human, every person knows they have a mind. That's the most obvious thing in the world, your mind. I mean, we know that subjective experience is obvious to everyone except for scientists because we don't have any way to define it. So I went to look through nature to see if I can see where it is, but I, since we can't define it, I chose to look for communication as one example of what mind can do. Mm -hmm. And therefore I was looking for communications at many levels. Now, this book I stated with cells, and it's clear to me that cells have this intelligence and communicate. But my second, my next book that I'm working on now is uh, goes deeper. And it's clear to me now that molecules communicate and that communication occurs at the atomic level through electrons and through electromagnetic waves and photons. So the communication occurs all the way up and down through nature. That's my view. There, there's no proof, but what I wrote in my book is an example that anyone who reads it really can't deny that these cells sure look intelligent. I mean, you you could you could say they're robots, but there's no they sure don't. Yeah. Behave like Do you think people. there's a, a possibility the mind or consciousness is a, is a creation of the combined communications of of all these things? Yes, uh, that there are levels of it, that it accumulates the way cells communicate into uh, colonies. And then, so we're, we're a super organism. We're a super organism. We have organs, we have microbes, we have brain circuits, we have, you know, thousands of levels of things going on. And somehow they're all communicating. And, and then we have this thing called subjective experience. Now, we don't know what it is. One theory is what you just said is that it's uh, somehow uh, the level of mind is different at different levels. Mm. But we don't know that. Again, we don't know that. I, all I wanted to show is using the best current science that you cannot deny that cells are intelligent. No. And I don't say that in the book. I don't say that. All I do is I show you what they do and you draw your own conclusion. So. So I, I wanted it so that no scientists could argue with it. So I took only the best science from the top journals, nature and science, and, and I used only the best information. And I just painted a picture of the lifestyle of viruses, bacteria, gut cells, skin cells, cancer cells, etc., platelets, you know, uh, neurons, and then showed that they sure look intelligent. You know. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is, I mean, if you have a healthy, healthy mind, I suppose, um, usually it's created from from a healthy body that would indicate something to do with the cells being in good form and good tune and probably in good communication. And right. vice versa, if you're in a, you know, if you're unhealthy, if you've got bad diet and that causes your microbiomes to be bad and then therefore the information going to your cells isn't as good and their communications then around the body isn't as good. That's going to deplete your your mind and right i show that that you there's absolutely no separation between the mind and the body there, the mind. yeah you consider if you consider the mind having something to do with the brain then actually this is what harvard business review said i was shocked that they were interested that they wrote a positive review uh, saying it's very important to that they're saying that if the mind is associated with the brain, which most scientists and people do, then you can't just associate with the brain. The, yeah. the mind is associated with all the cells, with the body, and you can't separate it. There's no separation. So what do we do to uh, a clarity mind? Peace well, of mind, a positive mind. I have six things that I recommend based upon yep. the current science. I could just quickly mention them. One is obvious, everyone knows sleep. Uh, it's becoming more and more obvious how important it is for brain cells. So what happens at night in sleep is that the brain breaks down all the synapses 
and therefore relieves energy. So we, the body, because 20% uh, of all the energy in the body is used up in the brain through the, the processes of this axon and the synapses, 20%. And yet it's a two, three pound thing. It's a 2%, 3% of the, and yet 20% of the energy. So at night, it sort of dials it down, the neurons shrink, and then flows of liquid go between the neurons, cleaning out junk, debris. This junk and debris is what causes dementia. These are clumps of proteins that shouldn't be clumping. So there's normal processes. There's three or four normal processes to clean them out, but sleep is very important for those processes. So it, it, the, the neurons shrink in half, uh, the synapses are relieved, and then at night, the cells get together, and, and particularly this, this microglia cell, and they mm. decide what's important to remember from the day, and they strengthen those synapses for morning. When, it, when it, things reconnect and reemerge, stuff you've learned recently are emphasized. And um, when we re-remember, there's a new memory that is different from the old one and it eventually takes precedence over the other one. So I recommend, this is called the natural process of, it's called reconsolidation of memory. But basically it's a re-remembering, makes new uh, memories. And it's very complicated what memories are. It turns out it's all over the brain. It's not in just one spot, uh, it's diffuse. But so as we make these new memories, I tell people to think of the traumatic events and just add a little love to the traumatic events. So add something positive about your life now. So when you re-remember it, the intensity of the trauma is slightly diminished. So you just have, you just chip away at it a little bit and you keep re-remembering it, adding more positivity and you can gradually diminish the, the power of the traumatic the events. Trauma. Oh. Yeah, okay, good, good. So those are two things, sleep yeah. and chipping away a traumatic memory. Exercise, everyone knows, is a magic bullet. But the way it works is that after exercise, for a period of a couple of hours, the brain has unusual ability to learn. It's called neuroplasticity. It's an unusual ability. So if you take a rat and you exercise it, and then you give it cocaine, it'll become addicted much more rapidly right after exercising because it'll learn that faster. So you can learn good things or bad things. It's your uh. choice. <laughs> so in other words, you can use that to use your brain to learn good things that are positive for your brain, or you can learn bad habits that either are possible. So we have to uh, use our, yeah, yeah. Our, our wisdom for that. Diet, I mean, to me, diet's kind of obvious. If you read a label, and you see a bunch of words, chemicals, E, D, S, S, that you have no idea what the hell they are, don't eat it. Those are chemicals. In other words, if you can't understand what's on the label, don't eat it because that's crap. And the cells then have this crap that they have to clean out all through the body and they don't know how to do that. We're inventing chemicals that the body's never seen before and they have to deal with it. So yeah. also, you, you mentioned the microbes, and that's very, very important because let me give you an example, red meat. Now, red meat itself has some problems, but one of the biggest problems with the red meat has nothing to do with red meat. It has to do with a particular set of microbes that like red meat and eat what's called carnitine, and they nibble away at the carnitine, and they then create this chemical, TMA. The chemical goes into the blood, into the liver, becomes something else, and that creates atherosclerosis but it's the type of microbe that likes red meat. If you eat a vegetarian diet, you don't have those, therefore you don't get that chemical. So right. the type of diet we eat, it, now a lot of people take vitamins. Vitamins can be good, but by and large, we don't know enough about what's in a blueberry and what's in a grain. There's a million things in there. We know three of them. And we're saying, this is the vitamin. But the fact of the matter is there's a hundred other things that are probably likely as just as important. So that's why don't eat vitamins, eat food, eat natural food. I mean, yeah. not natural, eat, you know, 
there are certain magical foods. You know, blueberries are mag- a lot of the berries are magical. Mm. Grains are pretty magical. Uh, vegetables, you know, all the different vegetables have different things. So eat as much as that as you can. Um, uh, and I just read today that if we ate one fifth less red meat, we would stop the deforestation in the Amazon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, anyway, which was destroying the earth, but that's another matter. Anyway, uh, so then these last two things are very important. One is called how do you use the brain? And let me give you an example here. You're a high jumper and you're about to do your jump and you, you want to visualize it. You close your eyes and you visualize jumping. By doing that visualization, you jump 30% better. Yeah. But if during your visualization, when you're jumping in your mind, you go like this, you move your arms, it's 45% better. Well, what does that mean? That means that the brain circuit that you're developing to visualize the jump, you're creating a neuroplasticity, you're creating a circuit that's trying to bring together everything needed for that jump. You're adding the physical areas of it to the mental areas, to the visual areas, to the auditory. The more you can include the entire brain, it's called brain-wide neuroplasticity, the more powerful the memory and the learning is. So for example, why are musical events so powerful? Everyone knows they're powerful. Well, why? Well, you're there. You know the music. You know the words. The words have meaning. You know the band. You know the history of the band. You know the people that you're with. You're jumping. You're dancing. You're moving in all kinds of ways. There's rhythm. These are powerful, full brain plasticity experiences. This is the strongest kind of memory. Now, you add to that a spiritual thing, like a spiritual service, a church service, something where you have a, a really important religious meaning as well as all this other stuff happening, that's the most powerful experience you can have. And that's mm. you learn the best. So the important thing is to include in your activities, things that are meaningful, that use your entire being, use your body, you pay attention to that are important to you. People say, when you're getting older, should I do uh, crossword puzzles? I say, fine, do crossword puzzles. That's not going to help you. You need to concentrate on something that's important to you and that involves your... It can be anything. It can be gardening. It can be dancing. It can be art. It can be movement. It could be... Uh, and of course, meditation is a good place to start because there you're, you're, you're learning to focus. And, uh, you know, the brain goes focus and then free associate in milliseconds, bouncing back and forth between free association and focus. When you meditate, you strengthen both. So that's why um, it's good for both. And by the way, daydreaming is very good. So for example, they've done a study where they give the scientists a problem. And one of them sits and thinks about the problem. The other uh, washes dishes. The guy washing dishes solves the problem faster because he flips away and therefore he free associates and he gets more knowledge. So sometimes distractions and daydreaming are very, very positive for creativity. Then the last thing, the the sixth thing is the unique effect of nature on the brain. We really don't understand it. I, you know, I have a crazy idea that it's because we breathe out uh, carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen and we're sort of yin and yang, We're, we're one thing really. But the fact of the matter is, aside from all that, if you put a little EEG with a beanie on someone and you walk through the woods, just walking in the woods, you're meditating. You have the same exact phenomenon as meditating. If you put a little plant in a hospital uh, bedroom, people do better. If you have an apartment and you're in a city and you can just look down and see a tree, you're better off. The more time we can spend in nature, it has a magical effect on uh on health on the brain health so those are the six things that i recommend um brilliant and very well explained too john well thank you yes um and all all things we know but i guess the way you explained it then was was quite powerful how that works um because you know we know that going in nature makes you feel good 
We know that a little bit of downtime makes you feel good. I like the point about crossword puzzles too, because there's a lot of things, you know, saying doing Sudokus or, or, you know, things like that help the brain. But um, most of the people say, no, it's about doing things that are multifaceted that involve many parts of your brain um, that are better for you in, in longevity. So yeah, really good points anyway, um, to get to the short of it. John, you've got a great book out there, um, The Secret Language of Cells. Um, so that is available on Amazon. I'll stick a link in the show notes. It's also a Kindle version and audio book as well, I believe. Is that right? Yes. The paper, thank goodness the paperback just came out because the hardcover was getting very hard to find. So there is a paperback, there's a Kindle, and there's an audiobook. The audiobook and simple to read. To be, yeah, the audiobook won some awards. They seem to have a good person doing it. So perfect, mate. No, real pleasure having you here today, John. John Leaf, everyone. Uh, at the Hidden Wire podcast. John, thank you very much. Well, thank you, sir, for having me. Everyone out there listening, until next time, peace, passion, and purpose. See you soon.